take advantage of it and use it. And that's what this program is about today. And I, I was just fascinated in listening to you know, some of the other speakers in there. I, yeah. I learned some stuff. Uh, that's interesting that you, know, you would think the people with long, and when you talk about the party line or the collective line, it's smacks of socialism. But at least in those ideologies, they share more of that information. Where in our entrepreneurship, everything's a secret. You don't want to let the other guy know. Well, you, yeah, think and, it. you know, that's a important distinction. I mean, you made a very valuable point there, but, but it's also, um, you know, uh, you know, Hawaii. The, Hawaii has a kind of a history of the institutions. Well, it depends on who they're talking. Operating well, by themselves. I mean, here we're and seeing and talking to each in other, other communities, that's, they that's the one, that's are Trisha, connected together. Mm -hmm. right. And you know that you have more involvement in the you're business not, not community. Yet. Well, they have e mutual survival request, we are we are uh, <laughs> where we almost here in Hawaii have mutual destruction. Yeah, <laughs> I'm afraid you're right. As much as I hate to admit it, you know, I think you yeah. mutually yeah. assured yeah. destruction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's something that comes from the nuclear uh, non-proliferation language, isn't it? Something yes, like that? yes. Mutually we, assured destruction. Mutually assured destruction. And this is what the detente was really about between the United States and Russia. If we, if we are going to. We got mutually assured destru uh, destruction. So you can't. You don't dare go near the button. Right. Can't even scratch the surface of the button. Right. Yeah. 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 That's that's a important thing. We should be about one minute out, I guess. We should see. <coughs> now you, you're still going to talk about Travis and your daughter was the leader? No. Okay. I'm going to save Good. that. Okay, one minute. Wow. One That's minute. fine. One minute to go, Jay. Well, I found what I was looking for reading all these books on Chinese and Vietnam or his problem is he slouches and then all of a sudden he sits up. He's correct in training. Okay, see? Yeah. Okay. We can change it in the next generation. That's a lot, Terry. 15,000 Russians, 170,000 Chinese. Why the year? They were anti air most of the time. Welcome to Think Tech Radio's Focus on Asia Tuesday. Today's segment is Asia in Review with your host, international business lawyer, David Day. Well, good afternoon. We are coming at you live. Here it is a uh, few days in advance of the 38th anniversary of the fall of Saigon. And we are now, uh, with January, uh, it was the, is the 40th anniversary of the Paris Peace Accords in 1973. And so today what we want to do is talk about the, the fall of Saigon, what did we accomplish uh, as Americans, and uh, what have we learned? And I know that most of you in the audience uh, understand today that uh, Vietnam has been a country of enormous success. Uh, they have moved something like 60% of its population out of poverty uh, with uh, tremendous business development. And more recently, they've had some challenges with their economy and uh, some questions is about how they will be able to sustain their economic growth uh, at the rate going forward. But we want to talk about something different here in this program, and that's a piece of uh, history that I believe that the media has just pushed aside. And uh, there's a, to be fair to, to the Vietnamese people and to be fair to the Americans who were involved uh, in the conflict in Vietnam, there is another story and there are some lessons to be learned and part of the theme that we're going to be talking about here today is uh, uh, following World War II the the concept of betrayal and how that played into this whole conflict we're also going to be talking about 
what are the real losses? And as a, as a, as a lawyer, I'll tell you, we're always looking at the downside. You know, what are, what are the losses? And uh, uh, we're also going to be talking about was there a victory with Vietnam? And I know that may surprise some of you, but um, that's a, a piece, piece of the whole picture. So we're going to present a very different view than perhaps uh, many of you understand or have heard. And to help us with that, uh, we have an American hero live in the audience here. This is uh, a retired Marine Colonel Gene Cast Castagnetti. And uh, Gene, it's wonderful to have you here, uh, and thank you so much. Well, coming. thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. And uh, just so that you know, Gene is, a, is the director of the Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific. And he's uh, uh, not here in any official capacity. He's here as a private individual. I just want to make that clear. So we get That's it. correct. Okay. And uh, uh, do we also have um, uh, Professor Kang on the line? Maybe not yet. Okay. Uh, joining us later in the show uh, will be Professor uh, Win Van Kang of uh, Stanford University, uh, Vietnamese American. And uh, but before we get started, Gene, uh, very quickly, I understand that Punchbowl has a new uh, Vietnam memorial. Maybe if you could just tell our audience very briefly what, what that's about. Yes, David, and this is a good opportunity. Uh, the American Battle Monuments Commission recently uh, had constructed at this national shrine at the Honolulu Memorial the Vietnam War Map Pavilions. And this is very important. It was a $5 million project. Uh, set up and uh, monitored by former Senator Max Cleland of, Flor of Georgia, who was also uh, President Obama's secretary for the American Vital Monuments Commission. The c significant aspect of the Vietnam War Pavilion is this is the first government-funded memorial that honors the first the one. First one that honors the service and sacrifice of our Vietnam veterans. And I say that because the wall in Washington, D.C. is basically funded through foundations, corporations, and uh, donations. But uh, this particular Vietnam War Pavilion is government funded. So okay. it's the first in the nation. Interesting. Okay. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I thought the, the wall in Washington, D.C. was just like the Washington Monument was, was federally funded. Okay, let's move into uh, some of the, the background. We'll, we'll set aside your, your uh, current position at, at, at Punchbowl. And uh, just so that the audience can, can know, uh, when he was in the Marine Corps, uh, Colonel Castagnetti was a mid-level officer in Vietnam. Very junior officer, a lieutenant. A lieutenant, and didn't you come up to captain while you were in? in, in and you know? then uh, my second tour. The first tour, I was an advisor to okay. a Vietnamese infantry battalion. Had gone to Vietnamese language school down at uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Took what we call uh, the advisory course down there. Um, six weeks of Vietnamese language, which we basically learned how to call in artillery fire and talk okay. to Vietnamese. Uh, and subsequently, uh, I went back as a rifle company commander with what we call Bravo Company 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. Okay, what I want the audience to appreciate is that you had two, two tours of duty in Vietnam on the dirt. And uh, in the second tour of duty, if I, if I recall the history correctly, uh, you had an incredible 88-day uh, tour behind... Or, uh, can I, I don't know if I should use the word a patrol. A patrol <laughs> behind enemy lines. Well, let me say, it wasn't so much behind enemy lines, it was in pursuit of the enemy. And uh, it was ironic, my forward observer uh, thought he was going out for two weeks and we stayed out for 88 straight days in contact with the enemy night and day. Okay, so you can see, ladies and gentlemen, that, that Colonel Castagnetti has, uh, has some, some experience in perception point of view that, that maybe we haven't heard before, and that's why we wanted to have him here. And uh, I also understand that on the line is uh, Professor uh, Win Van Kain from uh, uh, Stanford University. Professor Kain, are you there? It is, uh, thank you for so much for uh, joining this, this show, Professor, and uh, 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 
just so that our audience can understand, uh, uh, at the time of the fall of Saigon, uh, what, David Davis. what was your position? What was your job? Uh, I am uh, very honored to be uh, on the line, on air, for a professor of law uh, uh, at the Saigon Law School uh, before uh, South Vietnam uh, was uh, taken by uh, military by the communists of North Vietnam. Okay, so for our audience, Professor Kang, let me, let me see if I can ex ex explain that so they will appreciate. You were trained as a lawyer, but at the time, uh, uh, essentially teaching at what would have been South Vietnam's uh, National War College, correct? Yes, the correct. Okay, and so um, you were there the day that Saigon fell, correct? Yes. Okay, okay. We'll come back to you, Professor Khan, just to stay with us, but thank you so much for joining this program because I know that you'll bring a... Uh, a Vietnamese perspective uh, to this program. Um, uh, and so back to you, Gene, in the studio here. Um, <clears throat> what is this? Let's, let's help our audience, because we've got some, some younger folks listening who may not know the history. But very briefly, what did the Paris Peace Accords set up in 1973? Well, basically, the uh, President II of uh, Republic of South Vietnam had written to President Nixon and asked for um, some conditions, three different letters. They wanted uh, uh, to get military support, they wanted logistic support in the form of weapons and uh, equipment and materiel, and they needed financial support uh, before they would agree that uh, the Paris Peace Accords uh, should be moved to a more positive and brought to fruition. Um, Nixon said, yes, you're going to have all of those three conditions. However, what really happened was they reneged on that. The politicians in Washington reneged on the three promises they made to the South Vietnamese government. Okay, but the Paris Peace Accords, what did that set up, very briefly? Well, it basically separated the two countries, the North and South Vietnam, at the same uh, parallel and allowed for what was supposed to be uh, peaceful negotiations. Uh, but really, it set up for the North Vietnamese to consider, oh, this is a grand opportunity to infiltrate and continue to uh, make their move to take over the whole uh, Indo uh, Indochina Peninsula. Okay, so this was in 1973. Yes, sir. That's where the 40th anniversary, and uh, just in, in one brief sentence before we get to the break here, uh, following the, the Paris Peace Accords, uh, one of the, the provisions allowed the uh, presence of the North Vietnamese divisions to remain in South Vietnam. Is that correct? Do I understand that correctly? No, that's not my understanding that they okay. were supposed to be allowed to remain in South Vietnam. But they did. But they did. All right. Okay. And, and this was the more secretive aspect that they okay. had able to infiltrate, okay, so that they had the position of strength in the upper hand without giving away what they were really after. So what we so we so what we get after 1973 was the <clears throat> the uh, withdrawal of American support for South Vietnam, and we get a uh, a a presence in that country of enemy combatants that uh, then ultimately lead to a situation where the the South Vietnamese military forces cannot defend itself. But interestingly enough. Um, the strategist for North Vietnam, General Vo uh, Nguyen Gop, uh, he indi indicated if America had not stopped the bombing campaign, the North was ready to surrender. He was f flabbergasted that America stopped the campaign to right. go in and beat them. In the South Vietnamese, the Republic of South Vietnam at the time, 1972 was in a very strong position of defeating the VC, the uh, Vietnamese Communists, and holding at bay the North Vietnamese. So you're, but, go ahead. So they were anticipating that we would, as America, continue to give the support 
even though we had identified, okay, we're going to pull out and turn the war back to the Vietnamese. So your point is that the, the effectively the Minister of Defense for North Vietnam, General Bo, Bo Nguyen Zap, uh, admitted later in his writing that they were ready to collapse if the bombing had continued. Correct, and sir. And there was a political uh, withdrawal of the support for bombing and so forth. And, and this is the kind of the setup of a theme that I mentioned at the outset. There is a betrayal here, is there not? Well, and I think along that line, because when you look at what history has said... Wait, we'll find out what history said after the break. Stay with us. We're going to have a fascinating uh, discussion here this afternoon. Let's take the microphone off. Take it out. 760 KGU. Part of the Wall Street Business Network. It's been very slow going west this afternoon because of an earlier accident. Now we have another one to complicate things. It's on the H1 Eva bound at the Arizona Memorial exit. If you're going that way, the H1 is stop and go back to the airport exit on the viaduct. The Moana Lewis lows at Fort Chapter Flats. Other problem is on the H3 freeway, Kaneohe bound. An accident up by the tunnel, and it's slow all the way down through Halama Valley. Pacific Forum CSIS is a nonprofit, nonpartisan foreign policy organization affiliated with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. From right here in Honolulu, Pacific Forum has, since 1975, provided analysis on current and emerging political, economic, business, and security issues for leaders throughout the U.S. and Asia. Also, the Pacific Forum Young Leaders Program brings young professionals and next generation leaders from around the U.S., Asia, and Europe together to observe and participate in high-level, multinational dialogues normally reserved for senior policy experts. To provide your support for the Young Leaders Program and to send future generation leaders abroad to ensure peace and prosperity in the Pacific, please contact Pacific Forum at 808 521-6745. That's 808-521-6745. Or you can visit them on the web at pacforum.org. That's P-A-C forum.org. Your product is selling well locally, so why export? Because 95% of all consumers live in foreign markets. Why not expand your market and increase your sales with help from the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone, your hub of international trade in Hawaii. The Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone offers you the services and support you need to start, grow, and succeed in your import-export business. Find them on Facebook at forward slash dash Hawaii FTZ or on the web at www ftz 9org You're listening to Asia in Review Thursday on the Think Tech Radio series here on AM 760 KGU. Now here once again is your host, David Day. We are back, we're live, and you can join the conversation by calling us at area code 808-296-5467. Uh, we are talking about the fall of Saigon, what did we accomplish and what have we learned. And uh, with us in, our, in the studio is uh, a uh, uh, 
American hero from that time, uh, former Marine Colonel Gene Castagnetti, and also with us uh, on the uh, on the line from uh, California. You're listening to this, right? Is is Professor Win Van, Win Van Kang uh, from Stanford University, and. Um, at the break, we were talking just a little bit about the history. We don't have a, a time to go into a lot of it, but I think there's a couple other points that, that we need to make. Um, uh, Gene, you as an American uh, got involved in this. You, you're involved in the Cold War. And uh, how, how did this come to be? I mean, what was the, the, the philosophy of the United States that, that, that uh, motivated you, that... that uh, uh, lit a fire under you that inspired you. Well, I think Dave, you got to remember, I was uh, grew up uh, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and certainly uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy uh, was an inspiration to all of us there. The history about his World War II action in PT Boat um, One Hundred Nine, but in those days, I grew up as a young American as. <clears throat> You believed in the solid character ethics of helping other people, fairness, just, justice, uh, helping the smaller person get along. And when JFK said we will go any place, we will uh, help any anybody, burden, pay any price. The burden, pay any price, I really believe that that's what America represented. So how does that translate into the whole conflict in Vietnam? Well, because... The president at that time said, we're going to Vietnam to help the Vietnamese people. He didn't say anything about going to defeat North Vietnam. It was a move to help the downtrodden. And this has always been an area where I, as an American, thought that was America's role. Okay. We weren't there to colonialize. You know, even in World War II, the battlefields are full of American soldiers that fought in foreign fields, but we never occupied the land except to bury our own dead. And that's a quote from General Colin Powell. And I felt the same way back in the 60s. We weren't going for colonialization. We weren't going for resources. We were going to help those people that couldn't help themselves, because that's what Americans do. Okay. So tell us about this concept, and uh, Professor Kang, uh, jump in here anytime. Um, the domino theory. We've heard a lot about the domino theory, and a lot of people don't understand that. W what was the domino theory all about? The domino theory is that uh, Did we lose you there? We may we may have a, a connection that's not that great. How about uh, Gene? Could you well, help out? If I with could that? jump in, uh, I'm not a, the expert as much as a professor. But basically, the domino theory was the Cold War was the ideology ideology of communism spreading throughout the world, and the belief was that if Indochina and South Vietnam were to fall to the communists then Laos and Cambodia and Thailand and maybe Singapore and Malaysia, those countries in that Southeast Asia uh, part of the world would also t fall to that type of uh, communist ideology. Now you got to remember that we had just seen in 1962 communism approach America shores 90 miles away in Cuba. Okay, and, and, and this was an opportunity to keep the expansion of communism away from those other countries that we believe wanted freedom, democracy, the same uh, traits and values that the American public had. And so the context of that domino theory came after the stalemate in the Korean conflict with, 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 with uh, communism from yes, the sir. North and the Chinese. And it also came following Cuba, right? Yes, and, and at the time, there were communist insurgencies developing in Indonesia, in Laos, in Cambodia, uh, I don't know about Thailand, but, but certainly in Malaya, uh, and which then split off and became Singapore. So that the whole, the, the appearance 
uh, of, of like a, a forest fire starting around the world was in the beginning of the Cold War was there. Am I correct? Absolutely. And you remember, the world was throwing off the reins of colonialism. Just take Indochina that had been colonialized by both the French and the Japanese. And now for many, when the Americans came in, there was still some resentment. Were we there to colonialize? We as Americans never think that way. But if you were the byproduct of the other countries that saw that they were taken over, where you started with the Japanese prosperity sphere in right. World War II, um, they had a little different perspective when Americans came to, to assist. But America, at least the ideology I grew up in, and all my high school teachers were veterans from World War II. They said, we did the right thing. We fought the valid battle uh, against Imperial Japan. We defeated Nazi Germany. We helped the small, the downtrodden that couldn't help themselves. And, and Germany so, became, these countries became successful. And so that philosophy, that attitude, that, that uh, morality that was established by the greatest generation in World War II, its attitude, that carried over and, and we can see how that produced the concept of the domino theory and the, the remarks of uh, President Kennedy. We will go any place, bear any burden, and pray, pay any price. And you're going to remember, people in my going through high school in the 50s and in college in the 60s, we were the children of the greatest generation. Of course. Okay, so we got into this war because we followed the ideologies of our parents. Okay, one quick question before we get too far out here. I know there are people in the audience who just want to know what, you know, can you, in a couple sentences, just a short piece, what was it like to be an American in, 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 in South Vietnam in, in those times? Well, when I went as an advisor, I really thought that I was making a contribution uh, to my nation and to other people that was beyond my expectations uh, in any other way. Okay. I couldn't do it financially, but I could put my training as a Marine uh, into effect to help other people. Helping other people is the, uh, a good friend of mine used to tell me, uh, Chief Justice Ron Moon, he says, service okay, is the rent we pay for living on this planet. Okay. And I believe that philosophy did, at did the time. The, did the, in those days, Gene, did the, the, the people of South Vietnam, did they, did they like having you there? Were you they welcomed? welcomed us. They welcomed us. When they, if I could say, chow ong ong man yoi, uh, a few Vietnamese words, that made a connection. They believed that I was serious enough to op eat my meal with chopsticks. They believed that if I would eat fish heads and rice and nook mom and these things, I was a brotherhood with them. Nook mom, okay. Professor Kine, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, can, can I ask you, what, just following up to the discussion I've just had with, uh, with uh, Gene, what was the attitude, uh, was it any different of, the, of the, the, the people of South Vietnam towards the, uh, the American Marines and American military that were in their country? Did they resent having them there? Oh, the, the Vietnamese people, I mean, the South Vietnamese people love Americans who come to fight for them. They come to fight uh, for free freedom and uh, protect them from invasion by the communists from the North, supported by China and also by the Soviet Union. You just, just mentioned about dominant theory. Right. It, it did not happen. However, Hanoi tried to do it, but not successful. After inv invasion by uh, uh, the communists in, uh, in Cambodia to uh, topple uh, Pol Pot regime, and they did move in Thailand, 15 kilometers in Thailand territory. However, it stopped because uh, American uh, uh, the, uh, the send uh, armor, I think that's 40 armor, 40 uh, armor to, to, for, for, the, for the Thailandese uh, army in order to stop it. Okay. And so they okay. receive, I think, that about $400 million for equipment to, to defend it. All right, let's... They try to do it, 
Professor Thank Kind, let's, let, let's hold that just for a few minutes here because we're going to have to go to a break. And when we come back from the break, I want to talk to you about your experience during the actual fall of Saigon. And we'll get into this point about the domino theory and stopping and, and possibly a real victory that many Americans don't know or don't appreciate when we come back after the break. Okay. So stay with us, please. Seven sixty KGU, part of the Wall Street Business Network. The problems to the windward side on the Poly or the Lique Lique. The H three is slower than usual because of an earlier accident, but it's clearing out. The drive east to Hawaii Kai is fine. If you're going west, the H one slows at the airport exit on the viaduct, and the Moana Lewis slows right after Middle Street. Inbound traffic from the west is slowing when you get to the Middle Street merge, and if coming in from the east side, the slow traffic on the H one Everbound slows at UH. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, is also brought to you by Hawaiian Electric Company, powering the growth and development of Hawaii since it was chartered by King Kalakaua in 1891. Today, Hawaiian Electric and its subsidiaries, Maui Electric and Hawaii Electric Light Company, serve more than 95% of our state, providing reliable electric service essential to our quality of life. The Hawaiian Electric Companies are also leading our transition to clean energy by increasing our renewable energy use and improving energy efficiency, we're reducing Hawaii's dependence on imported oil and in providing a more sustainable and secure future for Hawaii. For more information, visit hawaiisenergyfuture.com. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, is also brought to you by the State Energy Office of the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. How can we secure a better future for Hawaii? One way is clean energy. And the State Energy Office is steering Hawaii to that clean energy future. Hawaii is rich with natural renewable resources, the sun, the wind, the ocean, and the land. And they are all being tapped to meet Hawaii's clean energy initiatives to generate electricity, create jobs, spur economic growth, and reduce our dependence on imported foreign oil. To learn more, visit energy.hawaii.gov. You're listening to Asia in Review Thursday on the Think Tech Radio series here on AM 760 KGU. Now here once again is your host, David Day. We are back, we are live, and we're talking about the fall of Saigon. And if you just joined us, we are right at the point where we're going to be talking about what it was like to be in Saigon at that time. Uh, we've covered a little bit of the history uh, and some of the background, the domino theory, uh, kind of some of the motivation that, that uh, caused America to get into this conflict. Uh, we're talking with uh, Pro Professor uh, Nguyen Van Kang of Stanford University and also with Jean Castignetti, uh, the, uh, who's here in a private capacity, but Jean is also the director of the uh, United States Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific, otherwise known as Punch Bowl. And Gene was a former Marine uh, involved in that conflict, a Marine officer. But before we get into the streets of Saigon, in late April of 1975, roughly 38 years ago, uh, let me bring on the CEO of ThinkTech uh, in civilian clothes, 
General Jay Fidel. Jay, if you join us. I was in the Coast Guard, you know. I had six years as a Coast Guard lawyer, so you know, have to give me that anyway. <laughs> and I was, I, was you not need, in, I was not in Vietnam. Anyway, I, I just wanted to remind everybody that Think Tech live streams all of its talk shows here on the internet. We put streaming video on Ustream.tv and streaming audio on Spreaker.com. If you want to catch us live, if you want to hear uh, David and uh, Gene Castagnetti, you can, you can hear them uh, even right now uh, on the video and audio streams that we generate f uh, from, from our show. Check these streams out on ThinkTechHawaii.com. Remember, too, that we have a gallery for a live audience in our downtown ThinkTech studio, and you can come down and be a member of that audience. Well, how, how, do you, how do you get in, how do you get in the, the studio to do that, Jay? We let you in if you're nice. You can post questions to our guests, participate in the discussion. <laughs> You've got to reserve your place just the way Kerry Gershanik has, and he's right here now in our studio, and I hope that Kerry asks some questions here. <laughs> if you want to reserve your place, write to Jay Fidel at j at fidel.com. <clears throat> also, David, I want to congratulate you on a very nice job, job today uh, at the program we did at the Plaza Club. We've been talking about that. Hawaii's growing financial connection with Asia and how we can make it grow all the faster. You were one of the panelists uh, along with Varian Allen, Roger Epstein, Steve Connell, and Brad Puno. It was a, oh, and Betty Brow from Back for Hawaii. It was a great program and you were very good. We're going to do another one uh, next month at this time on May 23rd uh, concerning housing. We call it the 2013 uh, update of housing in Hawaii. Uh, can we minimize the cost? Can we can we ameliorate the high costs? So uh, we'll be back with more information about that one. Uh, thanks very much, David, for the time. Back to you. All righty. And Jay, uh, uh, on behalf of the business community and the people of the state of Hawaii, I want to thank you for putting on this, uh, hosting this program today, today on Hawaii's financial bridge uh, to Asia because I think it has significant long-term advantages for our children and our children's children. And so thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, and please convey my appreciation to uh, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and uh, particularly Bill Spencer. Thank you, David, and thank you for participating. And one thing that came out of it is that people want to have us do it again. So uh, maybe later this year we'll do it again. We'll approach it from another angle. We'll look at it, uh, you know, again with a view to illuminating, as you say, illuminating the bridge to Asia. Yes. <laughs> All right, we're back now. We're talking about the fall of Saigon. Uh, what did we accomplish and what have we learned? And uh, Professor Kang, uh, let's you and I uh, talk a little bit about what it was like uh, for our audience. Let me just paint the picture. Uh, okay. Uh, Jean talked about the Paris Peace Accords in uh, 1973, which basically set up uh, Two separate countries, as I as I recall, and uh, one of the the byproducts of that was the the withdrawal of American military uh, support. And so, as we come into the last days of April 1975, I, I, I imagine Professor Kang, you remember that very well. Yeah. And uh, as the the uh, the shelling or bombardment of the airport at uh, Tonsonat started to take place, and the uh, VC Viet Cong uh, and the the North Vietnamese forces started closing in on Saigon. Uh, when you were actually in the city at that time, were you not? Yes, I was. And what was the the attitude of the people in Saigon at that at that time? Oh, it was a chaos. They tried to escape. Just get out. But not successful. Get Some out. And, and and how? Let me ask you this: When did you actually leave Saigon? Oh, I actually leave leave Saigon at the uh, Saigon port. At 3 p.m. on the last day of April. Okay, so at 3 p.m., so let me back up. A uh, few hours earlier, there were North Vietnamese tanks that crashed through the gate of the presidential palace, correct? Yes, at 10 o'clock. At 9 o'clock in the morning? At 10 o'clock in the morning. At 10 o'clock, okay, I stand corrected. And so at 3 o'clock, what did you do? 
Uh, I would allow the uh, uh, port. At the port, okay. Uh, there are two or three ports in Taiwan, and uh, so I was uh, on one of the ports. Okay. So luckily, I was on a fishing, on a fishing boat. You got on a fishing boat, and did you have your family with you? Yeah, the whole family. Okay, now let me stop you, Professor Kind. What? Why did you feel that you had to get on a fishing boat at three o'clock in the afternoon on April thirtieth, nineteen seventy-five? You you were a you were a prominent lawyer in Saigon. You were uh, associated with the Saigon Law School. You you uh, taught at the the War College in Saigon. Why why did you feel you had to get on a fishing boat? Go ahead, say that again. I think we lost the connection. Say it again. If I was left behind, the whole family would be... If I was left behind, the whole family would have been killed? Is that what, is that what I heard? Yes. Why would, why would they want to kill you? Uh, intelligent people. Okay, because you were part of the intelligentsia for the 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 government of South Vietnam and the country. Yes. Okay, so you got on this fishing boat, and what did you do? So I was on a fishing boat, and so they uh, move out to the open sea at three p.m. until uh, maybe. Okay, so you, you get on the fishing boat in the port of Saigon, which is which requires you to travel out the, the Saigon River all the way to yes. Vung Tau, right? And then you go out into the ocean. Yes, to Vung Tau. Okay, so actually you, you are one of the pioneering of the boat people, are you not? You're one of the first ones out by boat. Uh, no, uh, we are a member of the group, the whole group. I understand, but my point is that, that for years following your departure from Vietnam, many Vietnamese left the country by boat, correct? Yes, you're correct. Okay, so you're out into the open ocean, and uh, how do you then get to the United States? How does that happen? Uh, in the... with uh, uh, um, American uh, LST. Uh, American LS... LST. LST. Okay, okay. And they, they find you? Uh, the the uh, officer on the ship saying that uh, this is the command ship. Okay. And so the, I guess the rest of the story is uh, you go to Philippines, uh, I'm guessing, and then, then on to the U.S.? Yes. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, you know, your story is, is an example of many, many, many Vietnamese Americans who, who left under adverse circumstances, and people in the audience uh, may not understand why this took place. And in order to, to help our audience appreciate this, I think that, you know, it's sort of like in elections, you know, elections have consequences. And uh, so do wars. And we want to talk about the downside, initially, of the real cost of losing the, the, the war uh, on the American side and on the Vietnamese side. And so, uh, Gene, let me go over to you. On the American side, uh, what was the cost of losing this war? Well, I think every rem everyone remembers that there was about 58,000 Americans who were killed uh, during the Vietnam War. Uh, 9, 000, uh, 9 million served, about three, 3 million served in country during that time. And there were probably some 300,000 wounded. But by the same token, the South Vietnamese, the Avin of the Republic of Vietnam, you got to remember, lost 275,000 killed and over 450,000 uh, were wounded. Um, it, it was a dispur of over a million boat people. And uh, the Vietnamese, from my perspective, served with honor. They are an energetic, 
driven, democracy, freedom-loving people, and they put their whole heart and soul into trying to defeat communism there. And they made tremendous sacrifice. Okay. Um, but it was all based on a perception that America would stay and help them with support. So there was a betrayal there. I hate to say this, but there was a betrayal not by the United States military, but by the politicians in Washington, D.C., who didn't have the will to put forth uh, and keep the promises that uh, uh, they, they said they were going to do under the Nixon regime. You know, we might have a caller who calls in and says, okay, that's all very fine and good, but uh, we have to remember that on the North Vietnamese side, their, uh, I don't know about the wounded number, but their, no their losses were very substantial as well. Uh, You're correct. Uh, Hanoi has subsequently admitted that uh, they lost 1.4 million soldiers. So that's just the killed. Just, just the killed compared to the 58,000. Now, I don't, mind, uh, don't mean to diminish that one American life is not an important uh, life. Most certainly it is. But if you were looking at the strategic or tactical uh, implication of body count, which seemed to be a, a big word during those days, certainly the Americans were able through firepower, military superiority and tactics and strategy, kill more of the enemy. Yes. Okay. But, let's. All right, I, I follow you, and, and that's a very that's a very important point, Gene. Uh, Professor Kang, I want to ask you about uh, another piece of the loss that uh, that that people don't talk about, and that is the the executions or the genocide that took place in South Vietnam after Saigon fell. Do you have any feel, or can you help us appreciate uh, that 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 effect? Uh. Did did we lose the connection there? Say 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 that again. I think we lost the connection, Professor Kine. The the. How many people? Or what's what's the extent of the genocide or the reprisals that took place in, in uh, South Vietnam after Saigon fell? In in I didn't understand that. Say one more time. Okay, the, and the reprisal numbers, how, 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 was it just a handful of people that were shot? Uh, they gather people up, those who, are, who were uh, opposed to the regime, the new regime, so they capture them and uh, uh, kill them, uh, especially uh, in the Puyen, Pinhoa, uh, and so uh, uh, killed thousands and every place in the country. Okay, and that, that what's, what, Gene, what is the estimated number of people, do you know, that, that were killed in this reprisal process? No, I don't. I think Professor Kahn would be the better one to, to have a handle on that type of figure that okay. went into the re-education camp. So, Professor Kahn, can you help us there, uh, my friend, uh, from your perspective, in the re-education camps, the reprisal against the South Vietnamese people? Um, is there a figure that we could come up with that said that these many were killed in a genocide? Yes. Uh Something like uh, 500,000 Vietnamese uh, officials, military as, uh, as well as uh, civil, were detained in long term, and 15% were killed in the concentration camp. Okay, so the number is 500,000 went into re-education camps, and of that, 15% were killed. Yes, that is a huge piece of the loss. Uh, and so sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, we have a tendency, we think of the Vietnam conflict, we don't understand, uh, because it's never been presented to us, the terrible price that was paid uh, with the American betrayal in Vietnam and the, the uh, pullout there. Uh, very, very significant. The re-education camps, 
uh, the departures out of the country, the boat people. Um, uh, I don't know what the percentage is. Professor Kang, do you have any feeling on, in terms of boat, the people who left as refugees out of Vietnam who died in the open sea? About 300,000. 300,000. Okay, yes. and, and so in addition to the loss side, um, we'll come back after the We'll come back after the break here, but we'll talk a, a lot more about uh, was there a victory here despite all these losses and some more on this theme of betrayal. We'll see you on the other side of the break. Stay with us. 760 KGU. Part of the Wall Street Business Network. Accidents right now, Sand Island Access Road, just in from Nimitz, and we got one on the Moanalua Freeway at the top of Red Hill. If you're going west, the Moanalua slows right after you go under Middle Street. The H1 is backed up all the way to the east end of the airport viaduct. It's because of an earlier accident. Windward Drive is typical on all three roads. Uh, going east, no problems on the freeway or on Kalani on Oli Highway out to Hawaii Kai. ThinkTech always brings unparalleled media depth to its programs, and our show Asia in Review is no exception. The Thursday Asia Business and Foreign Policy shows here on ThinkTech are hosted by David Day, a well-known international lawyer with extensive experience in the business and geopolitical issues of the Asia-Pacific region. Come join David as ThinkTech illuminates Hawaii's bridge to Asia with fascinating and lively discussions, featuring experts who unwind the critical issues and then probe for the solutions. Asia in Review with David Day. ThinkTech Hawaii is a Hawaii nonprofit corporation organized in the year 2000. Its purpose is to raise public awareness about the importance of technology, energy, agriculture, and globalism to the diversification and expansion of our economy. We do this by television shows on community television and on OC16, by newspaper articles, and by our ThinkTech radio series on KGU 760 AM. We also do it by panel programs and events, including our monthly luncheon programs with the Hawaii Venture Capital Association. ThinkTech, working to raise public awareness in Hawaii. Check us out at thinktechhawaii.com. You're listening to Asia in Review Thursday on the ThinkTech radio series here on AM760 KGU. Now here once again is your host, David Day. We are back, we're live, and we're talking about the fall of Saigon and the ramifications of that. Uh, right before the break, we were, we were, we were examining some of the, the uh, real cost items for losing the war, uh, the terrible uh, internal genocide that took place in South Vietnam, um, the, the refugees, the, the in incredible loss of life uh, in terms of boat people, and um, uh, re-education camps, uh, people put in prison. Uh, there was uh, a, a, a amazing education and other kinds of discrimination, was there not, Gene, against uh, South Vietnamese people who remained? Well, not only, David, not only the South Vietnamese who, who remained, but we remember when the communists went down into uh, South Vietnam after the Paris Peace Accords, they also went into Cambodia. And there was probably close to over two million in the Cambodia killed by the Khmer Rouge. We don't have the facts and figures on Laos even. But we got to keep remembering that who supported this, why the domino theory was really a legitimate one. 
China entered the war and nobody really knew about it. And what was the extent of China's participation? Well, I'm told almost 100,000 uh, Chinese who are supporting uh, the war there. And we know that the Russians uh, put in missile aircraft to defend uh, the North. And where did we get the AK-47 rifle? It was a Russian war rifle. Okay. It was a Chinese weapon. There's so there, there was this extra support that nobody in America wanted to talk about that goes back to the same uh, ha thing happened in Korea. We didn't want to admit that the Chinese were at the Yalu coming across the border either. All right. Well, we've got just a short time to wrap up this program. So one quick question. I, 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 I mentioned at the beginning of this show, was there a victory here? Uh, and uh, in, in a couple of sentences, real short, can you tell us if there was a victory here for the United States? From my perspective, I think America was able to contain communism there with the end of the Vietnam War. Why was that? Well, as far as I know, the communist ideology has not spread to any other countries since the Vietnam War. So all War. these insurgencies that we talked about in the program essentially were all blocked. They were shut down. They were shut down at least they showed that America was willing to make a sacrifice. Yes, I, I blame our politicians and I would face to face with them. The American soldier, the American uh, veteran never betrayed the Vietnamese people. It was the politicians. But even doing so, it was the American resolve to get involved to help people who couldn't defend themselves. When requested, we went to their aid. Gee. And I think we stopped and contained communism for the, for the betterhood of mankind today. Uh, we talked at the beginning of this program about betrayal. And you've, you've discussed this betrayal. We've talked about Viet, the, Viet, the whole Vietnam conflict as, as, as being a betrayal, not only to the, to the, to the people of South Vietnam, uh, to people like Professor Kine, but, but also to the young, young men and women who served Absolutely. As you Remember, did. we don't want, as happened, to blame the warrior who went to war following he, what he thought was his responsibilities. It was not the warrior that should have been blamed, as happened when the American servicemen came home from Vietnam. All right, let me jump in history. Benghazi, do you see a betrayal there? Oh, absolutely. As, as a, an American, I think we were there's a betrayal in Benghazi. There's right. probably other things that are Americans today are not as um, accepting of what the government says. Because as I've shared with you before, David, the first casualty of war is truth. Okay, let's jump to another one. Coming up, do you see the possibility of a betrayal coming to our young men and women who've served in Afghanistan? Absolutely. Um, the Afghan situation right now is how do you say um, what was our objective? All right, we never had an objective. We don't have a withdrawal strategy. We don't even know how we win. How do you determine uh, where you're going if you don't know where you're going? And, All right, you know, it gets there. We've got more, but not in this program. <laughs> have a safe drive home. Thank you, Gene Casignetti and Professor Win Van Kaying of Stanford University. Have a Thank safe you drive home. Today. Asia right. in Review Thursday on the Think Tech Series here on 